Welcome everyone to the 15th Vegan Convergence of the Peoples, BCOP 15. Uh, I'm Allison Hamju with Climate Healers, and I'm here to introduce you to Alistair Stewart, who is the Plant-Based University's Regional Coordinator for London and the East of England. Alistair will be talking about the Plant-Based University's campaign history, bold strategy, and capacity to make widespread societal change. Since its beginning in 2021, the Plant-Based Universities campaign has expanded with active campaign groups in over 70 universities across Europe and the United States. Plant-Based Universities has one simple transformative objective, 100% plant-based university catering. With seven students' unions already passing votes to make the change, the campaign is demonstrating the power of the transformative institutional demand. So Alistair, we are happy to have you with us, and we can't wait to hear about your campaign and what we can do to build on it. So take it away. Thank you very much, Alison, um, and to everyone uh, at VCOT15 for inviting me. Um, it's a real honor to speak, speak with you. Um, I look forward to discussing more. I'm going to still talk about for maybe 35 or 40 minutes um, about my presentation, um, and hopefully that, and there will be some time for discussion and question and answer at the end, um, which I, I hope will be useful for you. Um, I will share my slides now. Right. Um, I'm just going to thumbs up that people can see my slides, please. Perfect. Um, well, I will take it away. So, yeah, um, uh, th thank you again. Um, my name is Alistair. I am a regional coordinator for Plant Based Universities, which is a student led campaign group um, based in the UK, um, started, started in London. Um, and I have been, as Alison introduced, introduced me, um, I'm regional coordinator for London and part of the east of England. Um, and I've been in this role for actually less than a month. I, I finished my master's degree at University College London, which is the university you see in this photo here, um, uh, last month. Um, and I'm now a full-time uh, member of Plumbers Universities on the core team and a regional coordinator. I'm gonna be talking about systems change, our understanding of it, our vision for how to achieve it, and in particular, how we understand the relationship between transformative transformational change in demands and asks uh, and achieving systems change. So what is Plantbush Universities? Um, we are a student-led campaign group um, now comprising, I'm very happy to say that our numbers have increased um, since, since we last spoke, Alison, we're now, as of yesterday, we now have active campaigns at over 80 universities across the UK and the United States, Europe, and also very recently Africa, um, which, is, which is really exciting. And our aim is this 100% plant-based vegan uh, catering on campus, on, on, on college campuses. Um, we are a, uh, a campaign that is part of and kind of run by, supported by the nonviolent direct action group or the kind of mass movement. We use a range of tactics, including nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience, uh, called Animal Rising, um, who are um, now reasonably well known in the UK, I think it would be fair to say. Um, and Animal Rising run a number of campaigns uh, which um, have different aims and, and, and uh, kind of looking to involve different members of, of society in the animal rights and climate justice movements. Uh, one of which, and perhaps the most prominent of which currently is plant-based universities. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is who we are. Question we get asked is why universities? Um, I think there are a number of reasons why we, why we um, have chosen universities as being the kind of locus of change. Um, one is that they are leaders in society. Um, I, think, I think broadly speaking, uh, it's still a mainstream view is that universities are considered to, to be certainly academic and intellectual leaders within society. Uh, and it's the ideas, the political, scientific, uh, moral ideas um, that come out of universities that often are at the vanguard, the, the kind of leading edge of driving social change. Um, so I think that's one reason. 
Another reason is that the members of universities, you know, most of whom are students in their late teens and early 20s, uh, are really, um, really good people, re as in really, I think, really good people to, to reach out to uh, and uh, try and turn into campaigners and activists, uh, people who are willing to talk about and try and affect social change throughout society. Um, it won't surprise you to, to learn that uh, college age students are much more likely than their parents, six times more likely, in fact, recent UK research found, uh, to be vegan. Um, and it is the case, it certainly was the case for me during my undergraduate degree and my master's degree, uh, that there's a level of biographic availability, I think is a technical term, uh, when it comes to students. We just have a bit more time. I mean, you know, students do, we, we do work, often quite a lot of work, um, but we can often fit that work around doing other things. Um, and we tend to uh, not have so many external commitments in terms of familial commitments or, or financial kind of jobs outside of our studies, which just means that we have more time to um, think about these issues maybe and talk about them uh, and also get together and, and, and take collective action to try and drive social change throughout society. Another question we get asked, asked um, in particular by our rights activists, is why we lead with climate messaging. So it's the case that we, we, re we really focus on the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the ecological crisis, the environmental crisis. crisis. Uh, we, we, we lead with, with these subjects in our messaging, in our social media, um, in our communications with the press, in our, in our, you know, in our banners, um, and in the way we, we just talk um, to other students during outreach. Again, a number of reasons for this. I, I think probably the primary reason is that universities are the institutions that are producing the research on the climate crisis, on anthropogenic climate change, um, on social change, um, and on the relationship between food production and agriculture and the climate crisis. Um, so it's universities that are producing this research and a very big part of our strategy is just, it's very simply trying to hold the universities to account for the research they're producing. And because we see it as um, it just, you know, there's a level of hypocrisy, a level of inconsistency. Um, if universities at the leading edge of producing scientific research on the climate are producing the research, this research and they're not doing anything about it, not acting on it. Um, so that's primarily why we're doing it. I think it's very important to say that um, certainly everyone in the core team of plant-based universities and the people who really, you know, the university coordinators, I think are, are entirely vegans, ethical vegans, so like vegans for the animals. Um, that's not the case for all of the campaigners. We, we make it very clear that we are, we are welcome and inclusive to everyone. And I think there's actually a sense in which uh, inviting, bringing non-vegans, bringing vegetarians, bringing even meat eaters into the, can group, into the campaign group uh, can be a massive source of strength um, because we are very firmly targeting institutional change. Uh, we are not, um, we do not talk about, we do not target, we do not go after changing individual behavior. Uh, we are not interested in making individuals vegan. I think this is a really great strength um, because it allows us uh, to go in right. It, I think it firstly kind of drops barriers for entry to the, to the campaign, to the movement. Um, I think uh, there are lots of people who, who want to be, who want to help out and want to make these kinds of changes in university. Uh, but we feel a level of kind of dissonance or a level of um, discomfort uh, if there was an expectation that they would be vegan. Um, and we just want to bring everyone in that we can um, because we think that's the best way to affect change. Um, but then there's a kind of a really interesting um, interplay there because we, we often find that people who join the movement, who join plant universities as non-vegans or pre-vegans, this is the term that I like to use, um, do often just through exposure to other people who are vegan, through exposure to you know, the, food that we, the food that we eat, um, actually do end up going vegan, which is, I is a massive strength. And I think, again, part of our strategy. Um, so that's why we, we, we choose to lead with, um, with climate messaging. And how do we do it? What's our strategy? Um, so I'll just talk you through very briefly um, how we would set up a new campaign in a, in a university or in a, in a college, uh, just to give you an overview. So what would tend to happen is that um, a single person, maybe a couple people, um, at a university without a part of this university's campaign uh, would get in touch with us and perhaps via our website through signing up um, or through social media, telling us that they're interested in starting a plant-based universities campaign at their university um, and campaigning to get their university campus transitioning to fully plant-based um, catering. 
Um, so then we would uh, reach out to them, speak to them, um, and ask them to find two other people. We're looking at a minimum team of three to start this campaign. We then get them trained up. We conduct a three-hour training session that's, that's uh, led by a member of the core team, uh, typically over Zoom, um, to give them an overview of the campaign and um, give them direction and information uh, about what we do, how we do it, how to deal with the press, how to manage social media, how to run outreach. Um, and then that gives them the tools they need to go away, go back to their universities and start campaigning to affect this change. And the tactics for campaigning uh, are quite varied. Uh, we really like banner drops. Um, so you've, you've seen some banner drops just in the photos uh, earlier in this presentation. Um, just dropping banners on campus, taking photos, putting them on social media, sending them to the press. Uh, we do a lot of outreach, so just leafleting around campus, uh, which has a couple of aims. I think the, the first aim is just to increase brand recognition, increase awareness of what we're trying to achieve on campus and trying to get people who might be neutral or even slightly opposed to what we're doing, moving them um, from maybe that worried middle towards passive allies, the kind of people who at least might consider voting in, our, in the favor of a policy motion that we submitted to, to, a, you know, a, um, to the students' union that would commit us to fully plant-based catering. Another aim of outreach is obviously to, to, to turn people who already, who were already pretty sympathetic to us into activists, into campaigners to join our team. So that's another big um, part of what we do. But then the main lever by which we try and affect this institutional change is through the established channels of political change on campus through student politics. Um, so at the moment we're, we're really targeting students unions because they are democratic, democratic elected, democratically accountable. And what we do is as the core team, we help the uh, university campaigns to draft and write a policy motion uh, that commits the students' union, union catering outlets to transitions of fully plant-based catering, typically over a period of, of years. Sometimes we do it um, kind of incrementally. So there's a kind of 60% plant-based uh, catering by the start of next year, and then 10% increase up to 100% over a period of years. We help them draft this, this policy motion. They then, as students, as members of their, of their colleges, the university students' union, they submit this policy motion and uh, that policy motion will then be decided, perhaps by a referendum to which every student who's at least who's a member of the Students' Union is invited to vote in, uh, or perhaps just through a smaller meeting of Students' Union officers. Uh, and then hopefully we win that policy motion, we, we pass this motion, uh, and then uh, the Columbus University's core team, press team, swoops in, uh, takes nice photos of the campaigners um, and then we spread the news on social media and to the press um, and that is our theory of change and the, the plan is get the campaigns as many universities as we can train them up give them resources they need to win and let them win that that's what we do and that's what that's our business so just talk about our wins and losses briefly um, our first win was uh, just about a year ago. You see that on the left-hand side of the screen. This is a, from the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is um, one of the you know, biggest broadcasters in the world. This is on the website back in November last year. University, Stirling University up in Scotland uh, passed a uh, policy motion. Their students' union passed a policy motion a year ago. Um, and that was awesome. That was our first motion. Um, really made some big news. And we've had uh, six other universities, including the University of Cambridge, that's a Guardian article on the right hand side back in February this year. Um, uh, again, sim similarly, uh, not, not exactly the same as the Stirling University motion, uh, but a similar one expressing support for the, you know, for the campaign um, and helping us achieve what we want, which again is that fully 100% plant based catering on the university campus. These are two out of the seven of our wins uh, be being published, being publicized in some of the highest profile you know, press newspapers in the country. We've also had losses so on the left-hand side. Uh, you see information about Edinburgh there, um, again, reported by the BBC um, back in April this year, where the student union uh, referendum that was held uh, was rejected by students. Um, you can see on the right, the Countryside Alliance. Some people on this call may be familiar with the Countryside Alliance. Um, but basically a lobby group um, who, um, who lobby in favor of farming in general, but in particular in favor of animal farming and other, you know, countryside, um, you know, other, other things that people do in the countryside, including animal hunting. 
Um, so the country's airlines are very much opposed to what Plymouth University is doing. Um, and we can see here a press release from the country's airlines um, explaining that they um, actually contacted students at the University of Edinburgh trying to get them to vote against the policy motion that we were, that we put, that Plymouth University has proposed. Um, and they were in this case successful, but they won't be successful again. Uh, and then finally, a couple of things that have happened in the last, in the last four months, actually. On the left-hand side, a UN Goodwill ambassador, um, he was a UCL alumnus, um, supported uh, the Plymouth University's campaign, uh, just as we voted yes, as the University College London, um, Plymouth University's campaign had a win. Uh, when our students union said yes to our policy motion um, and then on the right hand side perhaps the biggest news that Plymouth University has had this was a Guardian exclusive um, at the start of this academic year and um, so only you know less than two months ago um, where uh, back then over 650 academics now I think close to a thousand academics have signed the Plymouth University's letter uh, which is just expressing support for uh, our demand for, for universities uh, going through that fair and sustainable transition to 100% plant-based catering on campus, uh, signed by a number of people, including George Monbiot and Chris Packham. Uh, so that was uh, really big news, really fantastic news for us. Um, so that's kind of, this is the kind of thing, so these are tactics, this is our strategy, this is the kind of thing that we've been up to um, over the last couple of years. Now, moving on to change, I think this is, this is just a, a table that I've created myself. It's not something that I've, um, I, I've borrowed from anywhere, actually. Um, but I think on the on the bottom on the x-axis of this table, um, you can you can see a number of different kinds of change that people talk about when we're thinking about animal liberation and the animal protection movements and the climate justice movement. Different ways of making change of making a difference in society. Um, so starting on the left, we have individual change in terms of the animal rights movement. That would probably look like people going vegan, um, or more incrementally, um, people you know consuming fewer animal products. Um, then we've got institutional change. Uh, which is institutions as a whole, whether it's universities like us in Plymouth universities, um, whether it's schools or government organisations, um, civil service, government departments, also charities and, and NGOs. We have legal change, uh, which is you know changing laws um, in the pursuit of um, campaigners' goals, political change, and then social change. Um, and I would say um, you can see the the, the Plymouth University's logo that's strongest is in the uh, institutional column. And in particular, in the transformative, in, in, in the transformative uh, row, um, we can understand transformative as being different from incremental. Uh, transformative being um, more radical, uh, being the sense of changing everything that's going on in the system uh, or in, the, in in one's behaviour. Whereas incremental is you know, gradual, is step by step. Um, yeah, plant-based universities who are firmly in the business of going after institutional transformative change. That is the 100%, the fully plant-based catering on campus. Um, so that, you know, that is what we set out to do. That, that is our purpose, that is our mission, that's our objective. But you can see the other five um, slightly um, fuzzier or slightly um, more transparent logos are other kinds of change that fall out of that, um, that, that institutional transformative change. Um, we see inst institutional incremental change, um, which I will talk about um, later in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, but we also have all sorts of other effects So individual change, both people who, who are aware of or who join Palmish universities as non-vegans, uh, consuming fewer animal products in terms of incremental change and also going vegan as an, as an example of transformative change. And I think we also crucially have, a, uh, have, have quite a significant impact in terms of social change. Um, I've you know, showed you evidence from, you know, we've been reported on by the BBC, by the Guardian, by the leading newspapers. And we get opposition from, from bodies like the Countryside Alliance and, and other you know, farming lobbies, uh, farming groups who oppose what we're doing. But all of this press, including the opposition, including our failures, including these tensions and these, these debates, all of this press is a way of making social change happen. And it's increasing issue salience, it's increasing awareness of us as a campaign, us, as, us, us um, and our demands. And it triggers conversations around kitchen tables, among families, among friends across the country. So we really see our failures and, and the opposition, this opposition that we get as part of our theory of change for how we achieve justice for animals and their climate. Um, so I think that, you know, Plymouth universities going after institutional transformative change, the 100% plant-based catering, all sorts of other kinds of change fall out of that demand, fall out of that objective, which is really exciting. 
many of you will be aware of the concept in social change theory and sociology uh, called the radical flank effect. And for those of you who don't know, um, the idea is that um, if you think of a movement as a whole, say the, you know, the animal rights movement as a whole, um, there'll be some, mem some parts, some groups, some individuals in that movement who are more radical, either in terms of their demands and their beliefs, their views, or in terms of their tactics. Um, I think it, it, it can be quite interesting to understand plant-based universities as being part of the, or on the radical flank of the, both the animal rights movement and the, and the climate justice movement specifically in terms of our demand. So in terms of making that radical transformative 100% demand for plant-based catering on campus, that's a much, that's a greater demand, that's a more radical demand, uh, that demand that requires more change when we compare it to um, other groups who are campaigning for issues that are, you know, that are more moderate than the fully plant-based catering on campus. We've got a few examples of this happening uh, where the plant-based university's campaign is set up, is established at a university or college in the United Kingdom. Um, and we see, even without us doing anything, without us specifically talking, you know, talking to the students' union or even explicitly campaigning, we see changes happen in the university catering service. Um, so we've seen at London Metropolitan University, very close to where, to where I am, the Plant Based University's campaign was set up. And then just a couple of months later, University Catering Service introduced Meat Free Mondays which is deliberately not something that we, you know, we, are, we are campaigning for, we call for, because we are about that fully 100% plant-based um, demand. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think it's likely they heard us, they, probably they were talking about this issue beforehand, um, but they, they thought our, our presence, our, our appearance in the university as a campaign, making that 100% demand, shifts the Overton window, the idea of kind of the, the, the window of ideas that acceptable uh, within social discourse. Um, and they're being pulled towards the fully plant-based catering model, the, the, the fully plant-based paradigm. Um, similar examples from the University of Birmingham, who introduced default oat milk as, a, as an alternative to default cow's milk uh, in students' union cafes after plant universities came onto the scene. Uh, and similarly, but actually wider, universities of Reading, Bristol, and Nottingham have all introduced what they call plant-forward catering, in response to, or you know, not necessarily in response to, but after the appearance of plant-based universities um, on their campuses. And again, this is not what we're calling for, but we, we I think it's likely that, you know, these, um, that these responses from university catering are something of a response to our presence on campus. Um, so we see those as, as wins, even, you know, even though they are only part of um, what a small part of what we're trying to achieve. These, incre these incremental wins are really important um, and we really try and celebrate them um, for a number of reasons. I think, I think one reason is just is movement internal. I think it's really good for campaign morale um, that we um, as a campaign are being very loud, being noisy about our wins um, to, to make sure that we are maintaining and actually increasing the attention that we're getting, um, increasing our salience, increasing awareness of us as a campaign and our, our demands on campus. I think it's really good to build a culture of winning. Um, the idea that we are always, you know, we are on the, we are on the offensive, you know, fully non-violently, of course, um, but we are here to make change. Um, we're not here to stop at Meat Free Mondays. We're not here to stop at default oat milk. What we want to see, our vision for the future is 100% plant-based catering on campus. And just some lessons that we've learned um, that may be of some relevance to, um, to those of you who are involved in campaigning and, and activism and trying to affect change in the world, which I, I, hope is, I hope is all of us. The first one is this, is, is this thing about not being afraid to be bold and radical. I think we've seen um, environmental groups and um, you know, maybe to a lesser extent animal rights groups campaigning for things like you know, your Meat Free Monday um, within institutions um, for a while now. And Palmas Universities was established partly as in an attempt to um, build on, but also um, almost radicalize and make stronger um, the, the progress and the work that's being made already. Um, I really think we have, a, we have a pretty diverse vision of social change theory and of, of our movement ecology. We've got all sorts of different people and groups um, all working towards you know, animal rights, animal liberation, and climate justice, doing it in different ways. And I think we saw, what we saw as a campaign was a space, was a gap, an opportunity to be bold, to be radical in our demands for fully plant-based catering. 
um, and thereby, thereby you know, shift the bounds of the Overton window, um, draw university catering service towards us, affect these other kinds of change throughout society, um, uh, from you know, individual change to social change, um, and we've had success with it so far. So please do not be afraid to be bold and radical and call for what you really believe in. A second one is defining, defining your own success. Um, I spoke about the importance of um, you know, winning culture. Um, I think this is really vital for you know, maintaining morale in the team, making universities feel like they are achieving, that they have ownership, they're empowered as individual university campaigns. Um, because once you've got a taste of winning, this is something that I, I'm experiencing myself, all you want is more. Something that we um, have struggled with slightly, or we, we, we did struggle with a few months ago, um, was um, something of a kind of failure of communication between the core team and the campaigns, exactly on this topic of, of how radical we should be in our demands. Um, so at one of the universities um, who were part of the Palmas Universities campaign, um, they had, they won a, um, a vote that was very tight um, and it drew a, lot, it drew a lot of attention from students and a lot of opposition um, went to it went went to a referendum that, that that was passed, but you know only only just the core team. I think having a an idea of being more more radical and wanting to you know just grab as much public awareness of this win afterwards, um, wanted to do a banner drop in a in a pretty high profile location in, in London um, to celebrate this win and draw draw you know draw attention to to our success, um, build on it, um, and just get get media and press attention. Um, the university campaign, having done a huge amount of really hard work um, to just get to get this motion through, to get this, you know, to, to pass this policy motion at, at their university, um, and having faced a lot of opposition, you know, it's really emotionally, it's actually quite emotionally demanding. Um, they they were subject to a fair amount of abuse and trolling from from even from some other students at the university. Um, they were very opposed to what the core team were doing. Um, because they were worried that um, making a drawing, drawing a lot of attention, making a big deal out of this win, because it was so narrow, because it was, the, the vote was so hostile, because it was so closely contested, um, might backfire and might provoke, trigger an opposition, the opposition um, set, uh, setting up their own policy motion, their, or their own way of countering what we just achieved. Um, and I think that a lesson that the core team, that we as the core team really learned is that it's very important that there is a single vision um, and our target, the target that we're trying to achieve, whether it's you know, institutional, social, individual change, is the same throughout the whole campaign, the same throughout the whole organization. So that was real food for thought for us. Um, and I think we made a big effort and broadly been successful in making sure those communications, that those channels of communication remain open and strong um, throughout our campaigning, just to, to build trust and make sure everyone is on the same page and pointing in the same direction. Finally, then, something that I'm really seeing at the moment is the power of social networks. I'm seeing um, when I, you know, going tra travel around the country, visiting the university campaigns in my regions, I'm seeing vegan houses um, of, of, you know, 18, 19 year old students, first, second year students at universities who are seeking to sort each other out um, and coming together, living together as vegans in, you know, in, in obviously in fully vegan houses, but also looking at getting into advocacy and into campaigning, into activism. And seeing that is um, such, a, um, such an exciting thing for me. Uh, and it makes me think what we're gonna look like in five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time. In terms of, um, you know, the open window, what, what's kind of acceptable, what's normal in society, um, the normality of being vegan, um, the normality of plant-based catering, of, of eating a fully plant-based diet, um, also, the normality of being a, being an advocate for change for you know for animal for animal rights and for the climate. Um, so that's something that, that personally I find find incredibly exciting. So, what are our plans for the future? Um, I think what we are going to what we want to do is continue to um, build our campaigns, increase numbers of campaigns, spread to as many universities across the United Kingdom, across Europe, across the United States, um, and beyond that. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we're we're now in Africa. To just continue building these campaigns um, and continue winning, um, continue passing passing policy motions through the students' union, through referendums, uh, moving towards fully plant-based catering on campus. Something that really gives me another thing that you know really excites me, really gives me hope for the future, is what we're going to do once we reach fully plant-based 
campuses. Um, and I, you know, perhaps there's something that we, we could discuss in, in, in the question and answer session. Um, but I think it's something that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a while off now, uh, but once we've gone through the process of, of transitioning all students' union catering outlets, uh, then all um, university catering service catering outlets, and then all, say, private chains, like, you know, Costa Coffee, Starbucks on, camp on these campuses, once all of these institutional changes have been made, um, where do we go next? I think there's massive potential for, um, for, lever for leveraging these wins in the pursuit of broader social change, especially coming from universities, especially coming from students who tend to be yeah, motivated, um, open to these new ideas um, and willing to make a noise in society and affect change that way. So call to action from, from me to you, um, please do check out our website. If you're a student, um, please um, get in touch with us. Um, either join the, the um, campaign at your university, at your college, um, or even better, set one up if there's, if there's not one there already. If you click on the QR code, it will take you to the website, which is, um, which is written down in my, in my slide here. Um, there's a sign up form on the website um, that will let you express interest in you know, setting up your own campaign at university. We will get in touch. We will train you to start this campaign, give you what you need, um, and then let you run. Um, and I think this is a yeah, massively exciting form of, of making change happen. If you're not a student, you don't, don't know any students, because please do tell family members, tell your friends who are students at universities about, about us. Um, you can also, if you feel you know, if you're able to and you, you would like to, um, you're also able to donate via our website. So that concludes um, my talk. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I think we've got maybe 20, 25 minutes um, for a question and answer um, session. Um, so Thank you, that's Alistair. That's very good because we do have a number of questions. Um, the first one in the chat is from uh, Donna. When trying to change the system, why do you think that diversity in membership strengthens the movement in making change of systems? Thank you. This is Donna. I, I, it's, Paul Watson said a very similar thing. There's strengths of movement in, in diversity. The strength of a movement is in diversity. So, I'm, and it was interesting that you said very similar thing. And I would love to know why. Why is diversity in the movement uh, give it strength? Yeah, thank you much, Donna. I, I think um, that for me, growing up as a uh, as a like, as a child, look, thinking about what I would do with my life. I think that seeing people who looked like me doing things that excited me, that engaged me, was a really, really important part of that formative experience. And I think the same goes for trying to affect change um, for student campaigners. I think people, people at university, seeing people who look like them, you know, who identify in terms of their gender, in terms of their race, um, in terms of their sexual orientation, you know, people who, who are in some sense like them, doing this, putting their necks on the line, speaking out, trying to affect change, is a really important form of, um, is a really important way to mobilize and inspire people to take action with us. Um, so I think that's an important thing. I think another thing is just um, building credibility and legitimacy with the, with the university as a whole. Um, I think that the biggest um, pushback or the biggest question, the biggest concern that we get from uh, students and from universities is this idea about personal choice, which is something that you know, vegans and people who advocate for plant-based food hear all the time, you know, the idea that we're trying to deny people um, food, their food choices. Obviously, there is some truth in that. In, in that uh, a fully plant-based catering system on campus means that there is no um, animal flesh. There, there, are, there are no animal products on the, on the menu. Um, but what we're trying to do is shift the focus away from that and shift the focus towards the, the massive benefits, um, specifically in terms of the environment, of a um, just sustainable transition to fully plant-based catering. And I think that having a, a student movement, a, a group of campaigners who are diverse, who represent, who come from different backgrounds, is evidence to the university, is evidence to people who are uncertain about what we're asking for, that there is this kind of broad-based wide support for what, we, for what we are asking for, which is a massive strength for us. Wow, thank you, thank you. And thank you for all the work you're doing. This is fabulous, very inspiring, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I'm, I think I'm, we're just going to do it in the order that the questions came in. I and mean, there's a question from uh, Michelle saying, thanks, Alistair, for sharing these wins. Impressive. I was curious about how your team might be working with groups in response to university-led animal testing in labs. Any thoughts on this? And do you partner with other groups? Or is your mandate very specific? And then we'll go to Tammy. 
go ahead. So with, with anyone that you personally asked that question, sorry, would you like to just talk a bit more about it or is... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, but I'll, I, unless Michelle wants to come on and 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 explain the question a little bit more, Michelle, saying, "Hi, Alistair. I don't know if you can see me here. Um, just doing my morning routine. So, uh, thanks for all your work. Um, really encouraging to see that change is possible at so many levels. And I just I know that in university, it's it is an ecosystem. So there's activity happening." good, bad, and ugly in other parts of that system. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about how you interface with those other elements of the system. And we know that there is a lot of animal testing that goes on in universities. Um, so just how, how did you sort of square that, I guess, with your mandate and, and recognizing that, um, you know, there's a lot of emotional heavy lifting that goes on in this kind of movement. So that's my in just in, in general, my question. Thanks. I'll go off camera. No, thank you, Michelle. Thank, okay. thank you, Michelle. Um, so um, last year during, during my master's at University College London, I was on the committee for animal rights society. Um, and I suggested, we you know, we spoke, you know, at some length, we had the base discussions about animal experimentation. Um, we, and we were considering running a campaign. We didn't, we didn't do it in the end, um, but we were considering exploring and looking into um, what my, what you know, UCL, my university was doing in particular. Um, decided not to go further, but it's something that I am very aware of, and I think it's something that uh, most people in plant-based universities, certainly, you know, the vegans, the people on the, you know, committed, dedicated members of the core team, are very and painfully aware of that universities, um, who are these, you know, these beacons of intellectual academic progress, commit um, this exploitation, this um, effective torture of, of non-human animals on campus. Uh, in in their pursuit of you know scientific progress um, and it's something that I think you know students who are not engaged who don't think about animal rights should be aware should be more aware of and you know I think certainly I personally um, fully support anyone who is trying to draw draw awareness of that start conversations about that and oppose, oppose explicitly oppose um, what these what these laboratories are doing on campus it's outside the remit of plant-based universities uh, we're very we're currently very strict on our on our narrative on our messaging um just focusing fo focusing exclusively on the climate crisis as the um, as a kind of as a hook as our lever for driving change and that's one of the reasons mostly for the reasons that i outlined in the presentation that it's universities who are producing this climate research and we look into a hold, hold them to account for that research um you know the knowledge that just food systems alone food production alone uh, take us over one the 1.5 degree global warming limit probably be beyond the two degree global warming limit set at the paris agreement in 2015 um these are really powerful facts and hooks um and levers the university needs to respond to uh and so we see we see we see the climate as, as our theory of change um but yeah every i i, I could probably add everyone in the core team very much in favor of um, people who are opposing animal experimentation on campus. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tammy, you're next, please. Hi, wonderful presentation. Thanks so much. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> I remember uh, seven decades ago that the food was awful in the university. Uh, and I wondered if you have uh, really put some effort into sustaining the decision once it's made. In other words, people have the satisfaction, enjoy the food. Uh, seems to me that's a powerful part of the of a campaign like this. Is that uh, has that come to light? Yeah, really good question, Ken. Um, I I would say that so far we haven't um, put much put many resources uh, towards specifically like like the kind of the quality of the food. Uh, what, what our real focus is passing the policy motion and then giving the university campaigners contacts resources to make that change happen, and in particular to make sure that the food that's being served on campus is nutritious is um, affordable um and is obviously tasty as well because i think that you know that taste for many people is like a, is a very important part of driving um change both you know socially and at the individual level um so far you know i'm aware of people on campus you know one thing that we do hear from students currently who are who we speak to during outreach who you might consider you know who, who are you know sympathetic to some of our demands Something they say is that the the plant based food that's served on campus is just not good enough, um, and that is a yeah that is a real source of frustration for us. 
Um, and I think that, yeah, I think what we, what we tried to do is just empower the campaigners at that university. Uh, we, 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 we have alliances and kind of relationships with a number of groups like um, plant-based health professionals um, and um, other, other organizations who, who look explicitly at the food nutrition um, and try, try and you know, allow those relationships, those connections to, to foster and flourish, um, then hopefully those, those kind of plant-based professionals can speak to the university catering services to improve the quality of the plant-based food across all those domains so in terms of nutrition and taste and affordability. Um, so that's something that we're aware of, but it's not something that we commit lots of resources to at the moment. I wonder if you have, if you have any advice, actually. What, 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 what can we do to make to make that food you know healthier. i think uh, and, uh yeah the, the thing that the hospitals are doing in new york as an example is the chef's selection of the day uh and they're, they're looking to bring just new new dishes forward with this the chef selection of the day i think that's a pretty cool idea mm -hmm. of uh, just constantly have a sense of change of of, of aliveness of, uh, of of a presence to what the people really are looking for and, and the tastiness of the food and the, the presentation too. Mm -hmm. I, I think having students on campus who are vegan um, and who, on, who are recognized as being you know, healthy on sports teams, um, you know, is, is, is really good and really important for us as well. Thanks for your question, Cam. Cool. Cammie, you're next. Actually, Paul's gonna be speaking. <laughs> um, okay. Hi, Alistair. Um, you know, thank you for the talk. And uh, like everyone else has been saying, congratulations on your campaign victories. Um, I'm speaking to you from Canada, and um, I've had a fairly long history with universities in Canada. Uh, in the 80s, I was, well, I was a student into the 90s as well. But in the 80s, as a student, I remember catering services. I remember going to a cafeteria and having the university's food. It was a centralized food system. Um, but sometime in the 90s, certainly by the 2000s, uh, that had changed radically. And I'm, I currently work at a university here in uh, Calgary. And um, food services is confined kind of to the margins, so to speak. Uh, you know, resident students who constitute a pretty small uh, proportion of the student body have some sort of centralized food services. There's some kind of catering for university events, you know, where, you know, where uh, donors come and have special meals or whatever. But the bulk of the food that's delivered at the university now is delivered through a food court. I mean, it's, it's literally a mall style food court in the student union building. Um, and so, um, and interestingly, I mean, this is a very profitable venture, obviously, and I'm sure because it's profitable, um, the university has re recently been wrestling with the student union uh, in the courts for a decision on who actually owns the student union building, who can benefit from, you know, the profits of the food court. So my question, my, I, have, I have two questions for you. Number one, is this trend, this sort of privatization trend of food services and the introduction of, you mentioned Starbucks, you know, coffee uh, chains, but the, but the introdu introduction into the university of food courts is this something that happens in the uk and secondly if it does um have you had any experience trying to um promote veganism in that kind of environment which is of, of course not centralized or different um you know uh, yeah, that's those are my two questions thank you much Paul. so to be clear a food court is i mean i think i think we have them in the uk but it, it's um a you know kind of this open area like 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 a shopping mall where you have private catering companies with little kind of booths or stalls yeah a, a and w tim horton a and w tim horton's uh um some some smaller um you know food kiosks as well like not national chains but smaller ones so yeah so there's no there's no centralized 
you know, group that you can really, um, or if you, if you can, um, you know, they would have to bring in basically private vegan restaurants of which there are not many. So they might have to revert to the sort of the centralized food distribution that exists, seems to still exist in universe, uh, universities in the UK. Mm. So we see in terms of the fully plant-based catering on campus, we, we think about this in three stages. The first stage is the catering outlets that are owned by the students' unions. Um, that's pretty, you know, we, 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 there's a pre-established channel for affecting change there for making those going plant-based. The second one is the catering that's um, owned and run by the university rather than by the students' union. Um, and we are starting to get into the, into the business of going after, you know, attacking, well, not attacking, but going after trying to, trying to affect change there. And the third one is, you know, the, these food courts, these private, these, these private corporations who have their own outlets on, on campus. So far, we are just in information gathering when it comes to private outlets. Um, so my, the information I can give you is fairly limited. Um, we, I think we tend not to have food courts certainly at the same scale, um, as it sounds like you, you, just, you describe it in Canada, um, but we certainly do have private chains like Starbucks, um, cat, you know, cafes, um, things like Subway as well on campus. Um, how we make those outlets go fully plant-based is, it feels to me like a challenge. I think we're going to struggle with that. I think a really, obviously, the key question here is who who has responsibility for those outlets? Is it the students' union? Probably not. Is it the university? They probably they probably own the land, but they're probably you know leasing it out, hiring it out, renting it out to the, to these to these corporations. What kind of jurisdiction? What kind of authority do the union, do the university have over the private corporations to change the food they're serving? We just don't know. And I think it'll depend on the university. Um, I look forward to speaking with you in a year's time at the next, at the next VCOP um, yeah. and um, reporting on, on uh, hopefully some success that we've had, certainly some we've gathered, um, but it's likely to be, yeah, I can see some, I see some obstacles there, but it depends so much on the university um, and it's, a, yeah, it depends on, on the university and their particular um, kind of financial and legal. Yeah, because I, I do think that uh, privatization is changing the face of institutions. You know, the the uh, a lot of those services that used to be uh, offered in house are now, you know, brought in from outside, outsourced or whatever. And and so uh, you no longer have a centralized authority that you can necessarily appeal to to, to make these changes. So it seems like a real seems like a, a real you know morphing of the of the institutional nature that's going to make it harder to affect these sorts of changes I, I entirely agree yeah I don't have any good answers at the moment but something that the core team will be thinking about in the coming months as we as we win more and get closer towards going after the private corporations okay thank you Alistair appreciate that thank you very much Thanks for your question. Allison, you want to ask your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Alistair, you know I'm here in Lima, Peru, but I'm also in touch with a lot of vegan leaders in Latin America. And um, I think we have an opportunity because a number of these vegan leaders are English speaking. Um, but also, I noticed that you're just starting to work in Africa. And I wondered if you happen to have someone who is Spanish speaking on your staff or if you see a path forward working in Spanish with uh, Latin America? I, so in terms of the language thing, I, I'm not aware of anyone in the, actually, sorry, that's wrong. I, there was one um, very committed campaigner, the um, League Coordinator at University of Birmingham, who is Spanish, certainly a Spanish speaker. Um, so we can speak about that after this, um, if that would be helpful for you. Um, I'll just make a note of that for now. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the kind of language, language in general, um, we have campaigns now in the Netherlands, Germany, France, and Spain, Norway. Um, sorry, I don't think yet France and Spain, but we're looking, we're almost there. Um, but certainly in the Netherlands, Germany, and Norway. Um, the thing is, most of the, most of the students there speak better English than the actual like British students. I'm mm. not sure how many people know about European students, but they tend, you know, <laughs> people from these countries tend to, spend, to tend to speak extremely good English. Um, so the kind of language isn't a problem there. They can, they, they, they broadly speaking, can take our resources if they need to translate them into English and then, then, then use those resources, whether it's campaigning guides or leaflets or posters, whatever it is. Um, 
but that is something something that we are aware of um mm -hmm. and yeah. we are think we are we have been conversations about how we um empower train up um campaigns in different countries with with different language needs um but that's something i'd love to speak to you about this um, about about offline because i don't think it necessarily means that you're going to have to have your website available in spanish i think that uh, there could be a, a, an option where, I mean, there's so much passion among the students in Latin America. I think that they, we would be able to locate people who would want to maybe take that job on. They could create a, a web page under your umbrella. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, a bunch of leaders are going to be meeting here in Peru in December, vegan leaders. So it might be an opportunity to to make a move in that direction. So I will, I'll reach out to you about that. Thank you. I, I want an image of, you know, the, the flags that you see at the top of a website, one, one with the kind of, you know, United Kingdom flag for English speaking, and then one for, you know, Spain for Spanish. I think that, that'd be awesome. So yeah, let's definitely, let's definitely talk. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ken. I just a just a quick note. Uh, we uh, and our family moved uh, and had uh, this year and had about uh, ninety days when we really couldn't cook effectively at, at home. Uh, we tyrannized the restaurants uh, in our in our little uh, uh, part of Lima. Or yeah, the, the, to being fully plant based. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, uh huh. Or or they'll lose that business altogether. Uh, and not to charge uh, here, not to charge extra for uh, plant-based milk, for instance, things like that. Just a, a way, a way to open them up to a new market, a new opportunity. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, that makes sense. I mean, uh, having having that fully plant-based, hundred percent plant-based demand is a really is like the core of our identity as, as plant-based universities, and that's for strategic purposes as well as as well as symbolic purposes. Um, so. If we were to, you know, when we, as and when we start dealing with um, private private catering outlets like, you know, Starbucks on campus, um, we we would want to be asking them to go pretty plant based, and and I think we we might consider think, you know, boycotts as you know as you, you alluded to, trying to organise that kind of change to drive that change. Um, I think that our just our presence, our appearance on campus, is the kind of thing that would encourage chains like Starbucks. To make this more incremental changes, like increasing the number of options, the number of plant-based options on the menu, like not adding a surcharge for plant milk as opposed to cow's milk, um, which we would see, which we want, to, we want to bank those. That there's there's an incremental wins for us, but we don't want to stop there. We, we want to build until we have fully plant-based Starbucks on campus. I don't know if any of those exist currently, um, but watch this space, and hopefully in you know a couple of years' time, um, you'll you'll see the first plant-based Starbucks on a UK university thanks to plant-based universities. Somebody recently said bold and radical, I think. Exactly. That's us. We have just a few minutes left. Ray, can you ask your question succinctly, please? Sure. Uh, great work, Alex. Sir. Uh, it's very exciting to see the universities get involved in that. Uh, one of the things that it uh, made me think of is the divestment movement from fossil fuels in universities. Have you heard anything about divesting from um, animal agriculture? That's something that the core team at Plymouth Universities are currently speaking about. I think there's loads of scope um, for that to be a really exciting terms of bringing attention to fossil fuels and the economic relations between universities and other um, powerful institutions and fossil fuel companies um, and drawing attention to that and, and weakening those relationships. And I think we need to do the same thing with analog agriculture. Um, so again, please watch this space. And I think I think over the next year, you're going to see um, divestment campaign, analog divestment campaigns um, coming out of plant-based universities. I'm curious, where do you see the opposition? Every there's many of these universities will have an agricultural department. Do the uh, the uh, meat lobby are they? Do you feel their their actions, and is it behind the scenes, or is, uh, do you have evidence of uh, overt attempts to work what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, so I'm not sure if you saw my yeah. 
there was a slide I presented earlier, um, a press release from the Countryside Alliance, which is a UK um, animal farming and animal exploitation lobby. I think it would be, it would be fair, you know, we would call it animal exploitation lobby, to advocate for animal farming, fishing, hunting, shooting, etc. Um, and they said in a press release, they, they, they explicitly said in a, in a press release following the plant-based university's motion for failing at the University of Edinburgh, that they mobilised, they contacted students at Edinburgh and got them to mobilise and, and vote against our motion. Um, they were typically, I think there were a lot of vets there, so vet, vet, veterinary students there. Um, I think that um, members of, I mean, we also see you know, some, certainly not all, but some members of the Conservative Society, for instance, on campus, um, or people who had uh, I mean, connections with, with, you know, rural, with farming, with animal farming. Um, they're the kinds of groups um, who oppose what we're doing, um, who, we're, who we're aware of. And a massive, a massive part of our strategy for dealing with that is speaking to them, is reaching out to them um, and um, trying, to, trying to bring them closer to us. But it is something, you know, when you have success as a vegan, as a plant-based campaigner, you get opposition and that opposition, that is evidence of our success. Um, and it's something that we are, you know, we are aware of and we, 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 do, we, I mean, we do manage. How much of the pushback is from the students themselves, that, like the, the personal freedoms of uh, th those arguments that uh, you're taking away options from somebody? There's a lot of that. Yeah, we get a lot of that. And we try and shift the focus from this idea of reducing personal choice to focusing on institutional choice. How can the university justify serving animal products, you know, contributing towards causing animal agriculture in the context of a climate crisis that they're producing research from. So that, that's basically our strategy for dealing with that, with that pushback. Thanks a lot, Elster. We'll be looking, we'll watch it with uh, close interest. Thank you. So Alistair, uh, thank you so much. And um, I think you're gonna find that there are a number of us here who have uh, people that we know who are active in the universities and who are looking for ways to do what you're doing. So it was really cool to hear how it is that you're supporting them and not taking on all the work yourself, but enabling them to do the work themselves. So that's uh, very inspiring. And thanks so much for joining us this morning. I'll be in touch very shortly. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you to everyone who listened um, today. And thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And just from my perspective, my first talk I gave is the regional coordinator of Department Universities. Such a pleasure. I have rarely come across such lovely people. Um, so yeah, I really, I, I really appreciate it. It gives me real like um, hope for the for the future <laughs> of veganism and you know, animal justice, climate justice movements. Thank you. Thank you.